All right. Hey, welcome to another episode of Coach P's Perspective. I am pumped. Today I have uh, my good friends, an absolute monster in football, Wyatt Huber. Wyatt is from uh, Shawnee Heights High School. I actually got to coach Wyatt in middle school football, a little bit in wrestling. He went on to K-State, was a uh, three-time or three-year starter for K-State, couple time, all Big 12, just an incredible defensive end, uh, will be an All-American. So just got invited to the uh, Senior Bowl and declared that so he has one more year but he declared he's going to go ahead and go to the nfl and uh if you're watching this on video you'll be able to see you know why it's next to me he's ginormous if you're listening to this on podcast then uh, you can jump on google white hubert real quick from kansas state university and you'll be able to see you know see why but why thanks for being on yeah coach p you know i appreciate it. uh thank you for having me and uh, definitely excited to you know, talk with you about anything you're gonna ask me. So yeah, you bet. So anybody watching this on video, we both just happen to be wearing beanies today, which is cool. So <laughs> yeah. trying to be like white Hubert in my life. But um, all right, man. So let's just do this for those who don't know you. Like, okay. tell us about your backgrounds. Uh, you grew up here in Topeka, Kansas, but a little bit about you know where you grew up, maybe sports you played growing up, and how you got into football. Yeah. Uh, well, I grew up here in Topeka, Kansas, uh, a few miles down the road, actually. Um, attended Shawnee Heights High School, middle school, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, growing up, I had two older, two older sisters, older brother and a younger brother. And, uh, you know, coach, you know, my older brother and younger brother, brother pretty well. Um, you know, us three, you know, that was our main competitive, competitiveness, our, our main drive growing up. You know, we were so competitive with everything we did, whether it was outside, inside, you know, video games, sports, everything we did, you know, we just wanted to win. Um, you know, and the main thing that motivated me was just seeing my, you know, my older brother have so much success on the field or on the court. Or on the track, and um, you know, I was a I was two years younger than him, so I saw all the all the success he had. So, uh, you know, when I started to evolve in sports and started getting involved in all those kind of things, um, I wanted to be just like Austin. Um, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to win, and I wanted to be the best at what I did. And uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to him because, um, you know, he's the one that also you know made me so tough mentally and physically. Yeah. Um, he was hard on me growing up, and I just give a lot of credit to him. And, uh, you know, I just carried that same mindset with me through high school and uh, through my whole entire college career. And, uh, you know, it really helped me out and was super beneficial. Yeah. So Wyatt's brother, Austin, his older brother, uh, played football for me as well. He was a stud running back, went into high school, ended up being a top-notch receiver, and then went to a Division II school, played for Washburn University here in Topeka, was a starting receiver for them, a team captain. And uh, Austin is an outright freakish athlete himself. Mm -hmm. Even though he's a phenomenal athlete, you guys are built a little different. And it's funny to me because um, Austin was not a small kid in middle school when he was my running back. And, uh, you know, you're a little brother, but you ended up being way bigger, yeah. you know, and he's a wide receiver and uh, you are literally like a J.J. Watt clone. So uh, tell me tell me about this real quick. So when you got into high school, you wanted, you know, you said like, hey, football is going to be my main sport. I want to get huge. I want to get big and muscular. And you went on this like – milk diet yeah. <laughs> or you were just drinking like a ton of milk so tell me about that yeah. uh well uh you know sophomore season is usually the heavy recruiting season of uh um, you know when you're in high school getting recruited by college coaches and programs and um you know I was about the same height you know six four ish uh, but I only weighed 200 pounds and playing linebacker DN I just knew that was way too small uh, especially if I wanted to be recruited at a division one level uh, so, you know, I research and research, you know, I try to find, you know, certain ways to gain muscle, um, obviously in the healthiest form as possible. You know, I just don't want to go out there and take a bunch of, you know, supplements that were kind of fake. I wanted to do it as, you know, as organically as possible and just do it, do it the right way. Uh, so I came across this challenge called a uh, go mad challenge. It stands for gallon of milk a day. Um, so basically what it is, is you drink a gallon of whole milk every single day for 30 days straight. And, um, you know, I was super dedicated to it. You know, I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to follow it to a T. Um, so, you know, I started off, I would drink, you know, I had a quart jug and um, I had a quart when I would wake up right before I went to school, I drink a quart at lunch at school. After practice, I would drink a quart. And then right before bed, I would drink a quart. And it wasn't no problem for me because I love milk. I love drinking milk, especially vitamin D milk. Um, not going to lie, it was definitely hard to keep up with that and stay consistent for 30 days straight just because it was kind of a challenge. You know, you always felt full, um, but, you know, it was super beneficial and uh, kind of the research and the science behind, you know, the Go Mad Challenge was 
um, just milk, all the nutrients and all the things that it carries within it, you know, just help you, you know, build muscle uh, so fast. And obviously when you did the, when you did the go mad challenge, you had to stay on top of your weightlifting and your cardio as well. Because yeah. if you're, if you just drank a bunch of vitamin D milk, you just get, you know, super, super fat and super big. Uh, so, you know, I lifted super heavy, lifted twice, twice a day. Um, and after 30 days, I went from 200 pounds to 225 pounds. Yeah. And uh, I think that was my, my first, you know, pretty big growth spurt went with, uh, you know, talking about, you know, my max is in the weight room and, you know, my, my weight, you know, I was like six four two twenty five, 225, which is a pretty good size for mm -hmm. sophomore in high school. So, um, like I said, you know, I definitely took that serious and that was the first thing that really accelerated me into, um, you know, really starting to love lifting weights and, you know, you know, being kind of small. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I remember it cause we're all like, all right, first off, like I drink coconut milk. I'm not a regular milk guy yeah. and uh, I just don't do dairy well. And, but I remember you doing that. I'm like, man, that's crazy. Like I can imagine I'd be so full. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like a month later, like we all, holy moly, like 25 pounds, like legitimately, <laughs> like you just like got yeah. jacked. And uh -huh. it was like this, uh, like you said, the, you know, big growth spurt, but yeah. it's and one thing that's kind of funny is, uh, you know, even till this season, you know, even just a few, four or five weeks ago, um, in my whole entire college career, I had my teammates in college come up to me and say, Hey man, what's this go mad challenge thing you did in high school? I'm like, Oh dude, if you want to gain some weight, you definitely got to do that for sure. Because yeah. we had a few linebackers that, you know, were 205, 210 that wanted to gain weight in the off season. So, um, you know, it was funny because it was just so weird having college teammates ask me about that when I was a sophomore in high school, Yeah. when I had no idea who they were, they had no idea who I was. So yeah, it was kind of funny. All right. Going back to middle school real quick. So Austin's group, you know, your older brother, they were undefeated for me. A uh, great team. We had like this epic middle school showdown yeah. on a high school football field <laughs> to win the, <laughs> yeah, to win our league title. Um, and then I think we were maybe five and two, or I think we had two losses with your group. Yeah. Um, but for those listening, I, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, all right, I think White Hubert had more penalties than any other <laughs> player I've ever had, but they were aggression penalties. It was like you're playing tight end and you would block somebody like out onto the track, yeah, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So middle school referees, you know, they're out there, they're throwing flags and, you know, for holding. And uh, I think sometimes they were just like throwing flags. Cause they're like, Hey, this guy's too big and strong. Like it's not <laughs> fair, you know? Yeah. So, but they were all things I'd be like, dude, be smart. But at the same time, like I could never be mad cause you were just doing your job, man. Yeah, and yeah. I think a lot of you were just, you were a man child <laughs> out there. So, all right. Uh, and then I got you to wrestle for me for a year in high school. For those who don't know, um, you know, you only wrestled a year, but was a monster for us. And every other year after that, and so you wrestled on the JV that year, I think as a freshman, um, whooping everybody. And I was like, hey, come wrestle, come wrestle. And you wouldn't. And I was like, man, you'd walk out and win state like right now. But at the same time, I understood because you are super dedicated football player. You love football. You get paid off. Mm -hmm. Now your senior year of high school, I thought I was going to be able to get you out. Um, but then you decided you were going to graduate early, go on to K-State. Yep. Tell me about like why K-State. And, and I'm going to back up and say this. Like you come from an athletic family, you know, we mentioned your, your siblings. Um, you know, you got family down in Oklahoma mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are OU fans. Oh, I'm yeah. a diehard OU fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but why K-State? And then how did you make that connection with K-State? Yeah. Um, well, I went to my first uh, Kansas State football game. I think I was in fourth or fifth grade. I went with my dad. Uh, my dad went to Kansas State. Um, you know, ever since the first game I went there, you know, I just fell in love with it. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just saw, you know, growing up, they're usually always good. They're always winning games, you know, through that period. Um, you know, besides when they had Ron Prince there, it was kind of a downfall. But, you know, ever since when Coach Snyder was there, when he came back, you know, they're always, always successful, always had dominating players. And, um, you know, I went to OU games too growing up with my family. Um, you know, OU was definitely cool too, but um, I just took a lot of pride in representing the school in the same state where I'm from. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't do that, but me personally, I just wanted to play at Kansas State and kind of show the state of Kansas that a kid from Kansas can do tremendous things on the field yeah. and off the field as well. So, um, you know, I got lucky. I uh, went to all their camps. Um, they offered me my junior year of high school. And, you know, it was super emotional because, you know, if Kansas State was my first offer um, in February, my junior year, and, you know, right after Kansas State offered, you know, I was getting, I was getting calls and text messages from other big schools, you know, Nebraska, Iowa State, KU, Missouri. Um, 
Cincinnati Bearcats, um, just other big colleges that I definitely could have, you know, packed up and said, hey, I'm going to go look at this school. Yeah. Um, but as soon as Kansas State offered me, you know, I shut down my recruiting process because I just knew deep, deep in my heart that was the team I wanted to play mm-hmm. for. And, um, you know, growing up, I watched so many, so many players I wanted to be just like. Um, and, you know, Kansas State, like I said, you know, I just fell in love with it ever since I ever since I went there, ever since I went to that first camp with my dad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I just decided it was where I wanted to be at. Yeah. And I respect that, man. I'm a, I'm a dude of uh, loyalty, you know, so being loyal to your state of Kansas, mm-hmm. being loyal to the school that you grew up loving. Yep. That's awesome. And again, man, it was the it was the correct decision. So you come in, you get to play for legendary coach Bill Snyder, mm-hmm. who, you know, really is accredited for building that program. Yep. And one of the things that we all love about Bill Snyder is and my in-laws are diehard K-Staters. And so I've been to a lot of K-State games. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, he takes guys, he's not getting the the best players in the nation as far as we're looking at five-star athletes and things like that. A lot of times he gets a few of those, but he gets a lot of homegrown kids, you yep. know, from Kansas or maybe maybe some of the surrounding states. But um, and then does a lot with them mm-hmm. and then goes in and, and, you know, periodically and for you is a lot, but beats big teams like OU and things like that. Yeah. So tell me just a little bit about playing under coach Snyder before I move to uh, yeah. currently under coach Klein. Well, um, you know, not going to lie, you know, I remember the first workout I stepped into Kansas state and, uh, you know, I was, I was a graduated from high school, but I was still technically a senior in high school. Yeah. Um, but I started my off season workouts with Kansas state that winter of 2017 and you know I'm not gonna lie after that first week you know I was like holy crap is this for me like this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life yeah and obviously I got acclimated to it um you know I just like I said you know that same mindset I had you know growing up with my two brothers and you know I carried that into high school and like I said into college and I just kept that same you know that same mindset and that same motivation in college especially when I was a freshman when I was young uh, when you had to earn your stripes from the upperclassmen and from the coaches. Um, and that offseason, you know, that was my first offseason. I actually won – my teammates voted me hardest worker on the team. Yeah. And that was a blessing because, you know, I was just an early enrollee transfer kid that should still be in high school. Mm-hmm. You know, getting voted hardest worker by guys like, you know, Dalton Reisner, DJ Reed, you know, Duke Shelley, all these guys that are in the NFL. You know, that just really – that really impacted me hard because, you know, I realized, like, holy crap, I'm getting praised from these big-time names. Um, so that definitely was an amazing experience because that kind of, you know, gave me a lot of confidence and uh, pushed me and excelled me, you know, you know, internally just to go out there and try to be my best every day mm-hmm. uh, and just be a better player than I was the day before. And um, but like I said, you know, going back to Coach Schneider, uh, you know, the first week, you know, the, the, the two seasons I played with Coach Schneider physically and mentally, probably the toughest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And. I give credit to all the guys who played for five years under Coach Schneider because I only played two and a half seasons and it was the toughest thing I've ever done. And that's why I have so much respect for the guys who did it for five years because they are the toughest guys I've ever met. And, you know, like I said, just how mentally and physically tough it was, you know, that's, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, workouts were an hour and 30 minutes. Practices were super long, two hour 45 and you just put your body through hell and back. Yeah. And and meetings were forever. And obviously it's college football. You know, you need to be tough. You need to be, do what you're asked to do. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought that was the gold standard of college football, though, when I because I was so young. I was like, all right, every other team is doing this. Yeah. And then once Coach Schneider left and Coach Kleinman came, I was like, holy crap. What I did with Coach Schneider and his staff, we were the only team doing that in the nation. Yeah. Besides teams like Alabama. And, you know, there's actually, you know, college football word on the street, you know, the Alabama and Kansas State are the two toughest programs to go through in the offseason. So, mm-hmm. um, which makes sense, you know, Alabama is so successful with what they do. And, you know, Coach Schneider coaches the same way. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I said, you know, I kind of got acclimated to it. You know, it was just another day in the office for me once I got going. Um, obviously, it was tough, but, you know, I learned to, you know, accept the pain and push through that pain and then, you know, the next step was next step for me was, you know, because like I said, I had to earn my stripes. You know, I just went out there, kept my mouth shut and did what I was told and just worked hard. Mm-hmm. We tried to work harder than everybody. But, you know, after I won that, after I won that award by my teammates, um, you know, I kind of earned a little bit of stripes. So, you know, that's when I first started to kind of realize, you know, I have some voice and I have some say. 
Uh, so I'm going to go out here, do these workouts, take first in every rep I do and, you know, work harder in every rep that I do, but also try to become a little bit more vocal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cause that's where the leadership qualities come in. You know, once you're in your stripes from the, you know, from the upper, upper level leaders and the coaches and the captains, and that's when you can become a little bit more vocal and, you know, start, start to motivate guys and start to push other guys with your voice as well. Yeah. So when Coach Kleiman came in, mm -hmm. um, you know, he had a ton of success prior to coming to K-State. He comes in, and it's funny because whenever you take over for a coach who's been highly successful, everybody's like, oh, you got big shoes to fill. But you want to come in and you want to create your own culture. You want to do your own thing. Yep. So just tell me a little bit about the transition when, when Coach Kleiman came in. I know it was a great experience for you, yeah. um, you know, being under him. So what yeah. was that all like? The biggest challenge for the transition was Coach Schneider and Coach Kleiman were complete opposite of the spectrum coaching styles. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to be a leader and a captain for Coach Schneider, all you had to do was be the hardest worker and stay off the list. That was simple. It was asked, you know, it was easy. You didn't, you couldn't be late to class. You had to go to class if you weren't late for things and you just had to work hard. That It was simple. It was mm -hmm. easy because because all the disciplinary actions, you know, Coach Schneider and Coach um, Dawson, our strength coaches, they all dealt with that. Yeah. And, you know, those those discipline, you know, runs or lifts, those were so hard that I luckily had never had to do one because I made sure to stay off those. But, um, you know, we had a thing called PIs, which was our disciplinary actions. If we were late, if we missed a tutor, if we were late to a meal, you know, if we were just whatever, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do and it's uh, PI was, I never had to do a PI, but you know, I've seen a lot of them done and they're some of the worst things ever. Um, so you had to do 800 yards of up downs every five yards. Mm. And then after that, you run eight laps around the field all timed. And then on the bottom bowl of the stadium, you have to go down and up in like, like a minute or something. You got eight reps of those. And I never had to do one, but just seeing that, just that discipline and just how tough a discipline run was or yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm staying out. I'm staying the yeah. hell away from that. I'm never going to do that. Uh, but, but going back to your question, you know, coach Schneider to be a leader, you just had to be the toughest guy in the room and you just had to work hard and set the example with coach Kleiman. It was completely different because coach Kleiman was a player based um, players coach. Like this is your guys' program. You guys take control of the program. I'm just here to coach football and, you know, help you guys out, help you guys become better men. Mm -hmm. So that was super tough because being a captain and a leader for a coach where they say, don't worry about it. We'll take care of all the, you know, all the dudes causing trouble. You just go out there and keep doing your thing versus with coach Kleiman. We were the guys that had to do that, you know, yeah. the leaders and the captains on the team. And that's, that's why I think, all the leaders and the captains developed so in such a positive way. That's why we were so successful last year with our, we had like 24 seniors is because, you know, <clears throat> if some, if someone is doing something they're not supposed to do and then a leader steps up and says something and calls them out and holds them accountable, but then you have three other guys backing you up doing the same thing. Yeah. Then it makes it easier to, uh, you know, kind of discipline those kids. But that was the hardest thing was, you know, being asked to be the voice of the discipline actions and hold holding guys accountable. That was definitely the biggest challenge. Yeah. Me. So super weird, but super, super beneficial. And, you know, benef benefited me and a lot of other guys for our leadership as well. Yeah. Well, I know you talked to me before about um, relationships. So when Coach Kleiman came in, you said, you know, not only him, but everybody he brought in on his staff, like they build relationships with the athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, they knew you by name. They stop and talk to you. It's not always just about football. It could be about life or whatever. So exactly. what was the importance of that for you guys as players, having coaches who, who, who built relationships and cared about you like that? Yeah, well, um, you know, having a relationship with your coach and your coaches is, you know, is so beneficial for sports and I've never been a coach before, but if I am a coach in the future, you know, that's the first thing I plan on doing is developing a personal connection to my, to my players and outside of the sport. Yeah. Because once you have that personal connection with your players, that just allows you, um, you know, allows you to be so much more, so much more of a better coach and allows them to be a lot more coachable to you Yeah. just because of that trust and that bond that you guys have formed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last year, you know, we had a very successful season. Uh, we were eight and five, you know, we lost a few games. And I think we should have won. 
Uh, this season was obviously a different story because, uh, you know, we had, we went through a lot of adversity this season with COVID, with guys transferring. And, you know, I look back at this year and it's just kind of scattered, you know, it's everywhere. So I don't think this season defined us who we were and who the yeah. coaches were. Um, but, you know, looking back um, with the personal connection, you know, the one thing I love is, you know, I can just drive over to any of my coaches' houses and just go sit down with them and just talk about whatever. And every time I had a question or needed some advice or, or anything, if I needed anything from a coach, you know, I could just call them up, say, hey, you home? I'm going to come over and talk to you for a little bit. And they yeah. say, heck, yeah, come over. And that was the coolest thing because I can speak on behalf of me and my teammates, but if you're playing for a coaching staff that care about you and develop that personal relationship with you and all your players, and that just allows you, that just motivates us players to go out there and practice hard. Yeah. Because we don't want to let ourselves down, but we don't want to let them down either because mm -hmm. of that trust and bond that we formed. And that's the most important thing in sports is, you know, just be having a close connection to your, uh, to your coaches, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know the coaches that I performed the best for were the coaches that I cared about. I mean, I wanted to win for them more than I wanted to win for me. And if I and if we lost, like it hurt because I didn't want to disappoint them. Exactly. You know, and uh, and it, you know, it was based off that relationship. Um, I don't want to say it's modern coaching because there's coaches like one of my college coaches. I mean, uh, he's you know 60 years old now, but he coached that way. He was phenomenal. Built relationships. But I think a lot more coaches these days are realizing, you know, that the uh, old school just I'm going to come in and you have to do, you know, ABC. And then I never even get to know you as a person. I leave and just demanding you can maybe get by that for a little bit, but it's not going to build a, a long standing program that can maintain a high level over time. Yep. You know, so you got to build those relationships. And for me, it's one of my number one things as a coach. So I love hearing that about Coach Kleiman. Mm -hmm. Um Again, I'm a diehard OU guy, but I'm also a K-State fan, mostly because you played for K-State. You know, <laughs> yeah. I like to tease my in-laws a little bit, but, you know, we live in Kansas, so I'm still yeah. cheering for them when they're not playing the Sooners. So let's talk about that real quick, though, man. So last two years, you guys upset my Sooners. Yeah. Uh, last year, I remember, like, literally, I went to the game. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I hope Wyatt has a good game, but not too good. Yeah. So the OU can still win, but Wyatt has a good game. And then you sack <laughs> Jalen Hurts like three times. Yeah. And you guys play lights out and yeah. again this year. So not just OU though, man. Whenever you guys are playing these, like I'm doing air quotations, but these big time programs, mm -hmm. you know, you have the OUs and Alabamas and these traditional programs that have won a lot of national titles. You're always winning conference titles for you personally. Was there or is there any like, oh, man, this is like a big time program or is it like extra motivation? Like I'm going to go in and show him, you know, show them like we're K-State. Like what was your whole thought process there? Yeah, well, um, you know, I approach every game the same way with the same mindset. Excellent. Um, it's the same game played between the same white lines. And if you take the logo and the, the colors off the jerseys, it's the same game. It's the same thing I do every single day. Yeah. Um, that was my mindset. And if I was going up against a bad tackle or the best tackle in the Big 12, you know, I knew I was prepared. I knew I did what I had to do Monday through Thursday, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was practicing hard or watching film and to go out there and do what I do best. And um, that was that was my mindset approaching those big games. Yeah. But then again, kind of contradicting myself a little bit. I love to win, but I even love winning more when you beat someone who has an ego. Yeah. And I know you're an OU fan, but you know, <laughs> OU, I mean, OU is a good team. Let's not, yeah. let's not lie here. You know, there's six years in a row, big 12 champions. And even Texas is a good team. Iowa state was good this year. Um, but it's kind of like, I'm trying to think how to, how to put this. If someone comes, if you're going against someone and in their mindset, they're thinking, Oh, this is easy. This is going to be a cakewalk. Yeah. That, pisses me off yeah like playing against teams like OU because mm -hmm. they just can't they just come in and oh it's Kansas State this is just another win for us yeah that's what motivated me motivated me so much because I was like okay you can have that mindset if you want but I'm going to show you that I'm that I'm the alpha on this on yeah. this line and not saying that in any cocky way possible but yeah. I say that because I know I've worked harder than everyone there I know I put in more work I watch more film that's what makes me so confident. Yeah. And just someone who playing against someone who has an ego, just because they were a certain Longhorn logo or OU Boomer Sooner logo on their helmet. Yeah. 
that really motivates me. Yeah. And because like I said, I love to win, but I love to beat people who have an ego with them as well. Yeah. So that was good because I mean, one of the things that I teach my, so, you know, I'm a mindset coach too. And I teach my athletes when it comes to mindset is, and I teach my wrestling team this. I tell my wrestling team all the time. I don't care what the guy's last name is. I don't care what his record is, mm -hmm. what school represents. It doesn't matter what logo is on a singlet. It's a human being, right? So you're going to shake hands and you're going to get after it. It's everything you did leading up to that point. Yeah. And then once you go out there, like you said, it's to me, it's they're faceless, yeah. they're nameless. It's just another human being. And you're going to go do your job, everything you trained for all week long. Mm -hmm. um, so I love hearing that. But we're all humans. Yep. So there are certain teams that you like to knock off or yeah, certain, exactly. you know. Yeah. Yep. So I, yeah, I feel that 100%. Um, and you know, uh, one thing that's kind of cool, um, you know, we have another coach on our, in our program. His name is Ben Newman, um, yep. financial guy, speaker, um, top 50 speaker in the, in the world. Um, he comes into our, He's at all of our games. He comes into our, you know, meetings before our position meetings and always says something to us, you know. And one thing that he always talks about is intentional focus, intentional focus, which is being focused on what you need to be focused on and not being focused on anything that causes undue or unwanted pressure. Yeah. Like the things like what, what you know, what it says across their jersey, what their last name is, you know, mm -hmm. their height, weight, you know how good they are, what their accolades are. He talks about what you need to focus on, which is going out there, giving hundred percent, running to the ball, playing with your technique, knowing the down and distance, knowing the situational, you know, situation in the, in the game, just stuff like that. You know, you just can't let those outside forces, you know, affect, um, you know, the things that you actually need to be focusing on. Yeah. Excellent. So, and I, you know, I always say like control the controllables. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to burn mental and emotional energy on things we can't control. And so if we're worried about records or tradition or whatever, you know, of that school, you can't control any of those. But like you said, you can control the way you study during the week. You can't control how hard you prepare during the week. Exactly. So your energy, your effort, your actions, you can control all those. And when you step out there and that builds confidence mm -hmm. and, you know, confidence is something that can't be faked because once you hit adversity, then we're going to find out like, was that a false confidence or real confidence and putting yeah. in the work builds real confidence. Yeah, it, it builds real skill set and confidence. So, mm -hmm. um, I still, even though it was OU, I still enjoy seeing you succeed out there and tackle people. And so yeah. I'm like giving like the old fist pump oh, and, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but for me and then on other teams, I'm like yelling at the TV whenever I'm watching you play and yeah. doing those things. So the whole family, my whole family, uh, you know, my boys, I mean, they're like, dad, look, number 56, like, there's Wyatt, there's Wyatt. So they're like yelling at the TV and they know, and they're like, look at his hair, you know? So Wyatt's got long hair and, you know, so it's, it's fun for us. Okay, so let's kind of move into this. Um, so you're going to forgo your last year. You've already graduated, which is yep. awesome. Mm -hmm. So graduated early, but you have one more year of eligibility, but you decided you're going to forgo that. And, you know, we've kind of talked and you've done a lot, man. You've kind of done all the things that you can do in the program. So now it's time to take the next step and you're going to go to the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, what made you decide that? And then, like, just tell me a little bit about this thought process that you have as you get ready to go into training camps and things like that to prepare for the NFL? Yeah. Um, well, well, if I was projected, you know, anywhere from five to seven to free agency, I would say, heck no, I'm staying. But that's not the case. And I'm projected anywhere from two to four, two to five inch range, which is a pretty good, you know, rounds to be drafted in. Um, and, you know, I knew that going into the season. I knew I had to have a good season, make a lot of plays. So um, I did. And, you know, unfortunately, I had 10 games. So, uh, having 12 games would have helped a lot more too, but, um, you know, it was a tough decision for me to leave early because, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a soldier in my program. And what I mean by that is whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, yeah. yes, sir. I'm going to go out and do it. Um, so then when the, obviously everyone's doing their job though, but, um, you know, people are saying, oh, you need to leave, you know, you're going to get drafted in a good round. You're going to, you're one of the top DNs in the draft class. But then my coaches, obviously, you know, they're saying, you know, we want you to stay, you know, we think you can have one more good year. And that's why it's so tough for me because I just wanted to make everyone happy. Yeah. I wanted to make myself happy, but I wanted to make my program and my teammates and my coaches happy as well. And it, it was hard for me to say no. Um, but, you know, I finally sat down and realized, you know, I was like, you know what? Um, you can't make everyone happy. You have to do what, what's best for me. Yeah. What, what do I want to do? What not what everyone else wants me to do. And, you know, being a three year starter two year captain, um, I felt like in two year all first team, all Big 12. And I was like, you know what, like, 
I've had, I've, I'm not chasing accolades. I'm chasing the NFL. Yeah. Um, so it's like, I think I've done enough. I, I'm, and personally, I was, I was ready to step forward and move on and, you know, take the next step. Um, you know, I'm graduated. I've been the three year starter. Um, so I was like, you know, what, what else is there? Um, so obviously, you know, it sucked, you know, not playing my last year, but, you know, I felt like that was the best decision for me to make. And, uh, you know, being 22 in the league versus being drafted at 23, that's a big difference is too, you know, analytical wise, you know, with contracts, all that kind of stuff, uh, but that people don't realize, but, um, I'm just, I was just ready personally to take that next step. Yeah. So tell me, what are the things you're doing now? I know that you just got an agent and mm -hmm. what are the things because, um, and I'm real fortunate, man. I have another player that I got to coach who made it to the NFL, Austin Willis, another Shawnee Heights guy. Yep. And uh, so I've got to talk to Austin a lot and kind of know a little bit about the behind the scenes. But so what are some of the things that you're doing right now to prepare yourself? Because, you know, you got to work out. First off, you have senior bowl coming up mm -hmm. um, and then, you you know, you'll have your pro days, you know, things like that. So what does the preparation process look like for you? And I know that you're just now kind of getting getting ready for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, obviously this is our break time right now. You know, the season just got over. We have a few weeks off for Christmas and New Year's. Um, so I'm just staying in shape right now. Just, you know, um, just keep my cardio up, keep my weightlifting up a little bit. Um, you know, the fourth, the third or fourth of January, um, that's usually the point in time when, you know, someone like me, you know, will head down to a training facility. They can pick out wherever they want to go around the nation. Um, I chose Florida because I wanted to be somewhere warm where I could wear shorts and, you know, T-shirts or no shirts at all. Mm -hmm. And, I'm gonna go down to there. It's called Exo. Exo. So I'm sure you've heard of it. It's like mm -hmm. one of the main facilities you train at. It's in Pensacola, Florida. I'm gonna be down there the whole month of January. Then the last month of January, I'm um, gonna go to Mobile, Alabama, which is where the uh, the college all, all star game is played at. It's called the Reese's Senior Bowl, um, which is you know the best college players in the nation. Uh, I think they invite anywhere from 70 to 80 guys, and I know me and then nine others are are only juniors. So. I'm one of the 10 juniors that will be there and the rest are all seniors, uh, which is definitely kind of cool being an underclassman at that type of mm -hmm. all-star game. Um, after that's over, go back to Florida, um, train the, the month of February and a little bit through March, come back to Kansas State for Pro Day, um, then go back to Florida. And then the first or second week of April is when the combine comes around. So go do that. And then the end of April is, you know, the NFL draft, which is, you know, the end goal for sure. Yeah. So, and, you know, we talked about it the other day, um, so, you know, is there any preference in place you'd like to go and you just say, Hey man, like, I'm just happy anywhere yeah. I can go. I want to go. I, I, the only reason I'm saying this is um, one, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So that would be really cool. And then I also like the chiefs. I mean, we're right here. My brother-in-law works for the chiefs, the, you know, the red and gold, but yeah. um, anywhere you end up would be really cool for sure. It would be really cool. Yeah. And you asked me that. And, you know, like I said, I really don't care. Um, you know, Kansas State was my team growing up for college, but for uh, for NFL, you know, I, I chase players. You know, I follow players. Right yeah. I, I idolize players instead of teams. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. So I'm a huge college football guy. So basically wherever my Sooners are at, I just follow those teams. Yep. So, but growing up in Oklahoma, um, we were all kind of Dallas Cowboys fans for the most part. Yeah. So I've always yeah. tried to maintain that loyalty a little bit, even though it's difficult some years. Uh -huh. sure. So <laughs> which is good. But yeah. all right, man. So outside of football. What are some of your greatest passions? Uh, greatest passions, you know, it's and hobbies, just things you hobbies, enjoy doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, even if I wasn't, um, even if I wasn't, you know, playing football, you know, I'd continue to lift weights and you know, try to stay in the best physical shape as possible, just because that's something that that's so rewarding. You know, taking care of my body is something I take a lot of pride in. Yeah. Um, um, I love to hunt and fish too. Um, probably all my friends in college and high school. You know, you know, all my high school buddies big hunters and fishers, big outdoorsmen. So uh, that's something that we love to do. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love to do as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, if you follow white on Instagram or on any social, sometimes you'll see some of those hunting pictures and things yeah. like that and <laughs> out there. So, which is really cool. And uh, some people may not notice about you, man, but you also dabble in music a little bit. So yeah, yeah. tell me about that. Uh, I learned playing guitar probably two and a half years ago. Uh, one of my best friends, you know, picked up one time and he started playing. And I was like, Holy crap, dude. I didn't know you learned how to play guitar. Yeah. He goes, yeah, it's not that hard. So I was like, oh, all right, I'll, I'll pick one up. Yeah. And, you know, I went out and bought one. And people always ask me how I learned. Do I take lessons? And I say, no, I just sit down and watch YouTube videos all day long. And just yeah. practice. And it's just all about practice. You practice it over and over until you get it. 
you know, once you learn that, you know, the next thing that's a little bit more challenging, you learn how to do that and, you know, just progress forward from there. But yeah, I, I like to play guitar. It's definitely something that's super fun, super enjoyable. Yeah. So, which is cool. And, you know, your buddy, uh, Jared Pittman, I mean, Jared, Jared likes to play and sing and stuff like that. And seeing you guys on yeah. there, another Shawnee Heights kid, but, yep. um, so I like that though, because a lot of times, especially like being a, a defensive end, man, like you're an intimidating looking dude. I mean, mm-hmm. you're huge. You got the long hair. I mean, all those things, but I know so many great athletes who are also well-rounded. Mm-hmm. They're well-rounded individuals and human beings. And that's something you can, as an athlete, because a lot of coaches and athletes and parents listen to this, um, we can get so caught up and so focused in just like sport, 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 training, training, training. Yeah. And then you also put a lot of extra pressure on yourself when you're doing that. And you kind of forget to enjoy the journey and enjoy life a little bit. Mm-hmm. So for you, like, I mean, how important is it to, and I know you work your tail off for football and working out, but how important is it just to kind of enjoy other areas of life and have interests outside of sport? Yeah. Well, it's good that you said that because, you know, I've been that person before that's just constantly, if I felt like I wasn't putting my effort and energy into football, that I was taking steps backwards. Yeah. And that was my mindset. You know, I was like, I was like, if I'm not watching film at night, whether it's off season or in season, you know, I'm taking steps backwards. If I'm not waking up on a Saturday morning for an extra lift, you know, I'm taking step backwards because, you know, it's kind of a good mindset to have because mm-hmm. there's always someone out there in, in the world or in the nation working just as hard or even harder than you. And, you know, my mindset is if I'm sitting down chilling, there's someone right there right now, somewhere in the nation working out yeah. and getting better. But then again, your mental health is so much imp- plays so much into your performance as well. Like you yeah. said, cause I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy that was like, go, go, go constantly, always working out, always doing something beneficial towards football. And it didn't last very long. Cause I got so burnt out of it. And yeah. I was so like, it may actually made me, you know, I was like, Holy crap. Like, I don't even like football anymore because I'm putting so much effort and energy into it. So that's when you say, you know, you take a step back and you have those hobbies and those things you do outside of football and you need to find that perfect balance and that happy medium between your social life or your hobbies and, you know, the things that you like to do and football, because, you know, it keeps your mental state at peace. And when your mental state is at peace, you know, I think you perform a lot better. Yeah. So what are some of the things that are like non-negotiables that you do? on a daily basis to be able to perform at your highest level, mentally, physically, spiritually, and all those things, mm-hmm. um, whether it be a wake up routine or like daily, you know, daily lifting, just what are the things that Wyatt Hubert has to get in every day to be, to be your best self? Yeah. Um, you know, I started doing this in high school, actually my senior year of high school and I've kept it going on ever since. Um, also, you know, growing up, I watched a lot of motivational videos on YouTube, like, mm-hmm. um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger videos, just people who are super successful who make YouTube videos. Yeah. Cause I thought those were so cool. And I just watched them and it pumped me up and it motivated me a little bit, but, um, starting my senior year in high school in football practice, I tried to do 10 minutes of extra work before practice started and 10 minutes after. Mm -hmm. And I carried that on in my college career and I've been doing it ever since. Yeah. I mean, I always tell kids, you know, freshmen, freshmen and sophomores are coming to me, you know, younger guys in the program who haven't played yet. And will ask me like, what do I need to do? How do I become, you know, good? How do I become like a key factor in, you know, on this team in the big 12 and the power five school? I'm like, dude, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter how tall you are, how big you are, you know, you know, there's no secret to having a lot of success. It's literally just work harder and put in more work. Those are the two things that you have to do to be successful. And that's actually what I was writing down my phone because that was my mindset going into it. I was like, oh, okay. And this, I've done this every season. If I put in 10 minutes of work before practice and 10 minutes after practice, that's mm-hmm. 20 minutes of extra work that you're getting done that more than anyone else is getting done. Yeah. And then you practice four days a week. That's 80 minutes. That's an hour and 20 minutes of work. Then the season is 14 weeks long. So you take an hour and 20 minutes times 14, and I think it's 1,120 mm-hmm. of minutes. So whatever converted that to hours is. Yeah. That's so much more work that you're putting in that other people aren't putting in. Yeah. And then take that times a four or five year career. That's 40, 50 plus hours of work that you put in that excelled you past those other people who are just yeah. settling to be average. 
And that was my mindset. You know, every single season I did that, every single practice I did that. And it definitely has paid off. And, and that's one thing that's so cool is just putting in the work and working hard. And then once you see the benefits come out of it is something that keeps me motivated. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, the benefits are coming. The rewards are coming from the hard work that I'm putting in. Um, that's what motivated me to keep doing it and keep staying with it. So that's something that I preached to all the younger guys and I preached to a lot of kids is just, there's no success or there's no secret to, to success. It's really just, you need to work hard and you need to put in more work than everyone around you. Yeah. It's funny you say that because, and of course we've talked about hard work a lot over the years, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't think we ever talked about that. I did the exact same thing as a college athlete. So I would go to practice 10 minutes before mm-hmm. anybody else was there. And we had like these wall dummies for drilling, for wrestling. And I would just get in 10 minutes of extra drilling. And then I would stay after practice and I would do 10 minutes of extra drilling. And um, our coach made us, we had to do like a thousand jump ropes before practice and a thousand after when mm-hmm. I was in high school, my dad made us do like 500 before and 500 after. And yeah. so it wasn't a lot of difference and my guys do that too. But so I still made sure that I was getting all that in, but I, same thing mindset was if I can put in 10 before and 10 after and do that every single day, I'm going to, I'm going to make, leaps Mm -hmm. over everybody else even the guys that are working hard and it paid off and so i often tell my athletes the same thing and uh, and then i sit back and let them do it right so the ones who want to do it are going to do it i'm not going to say like everybody's got to do it yeah and it's kind of cool as a coach to watch the guys who i don't have to say it again like they just come in before and they're doing work everybody else is kind of sitting around talking before practice and they're doing work or after they're staying doing work Mm -hmm. and again you see them and maybe it doesn't pay off that year Sometimes not even the next year, but then the third year, all of a sudden you see that they just make this huge jump. Exactly. And sometimes it pays off pretty quick. But yep. again, that builds into confidence too. Mm-hmm. Whenever you know you're doing more than everybody else, um, it, it's easy to give up whenever you haven't put in the work. Yep. But when you put in the work, like there's just something extra in you, man. There's a mm-hmm. fire that you'll never give up and you're going to go harder all the time. And of course, we see that in your career. Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing, you know, I wasn't trying to, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to sh- go out and show everyone on the team, hey, I'm the hardest worker. I put in all this work. Mm-hmm. I wasn't comparing myself to my teammates. I was comparing myself to the guys that I don't see, which is, you know, the other defensive ends at the big schools like yeah. Oklahoma, Texas, and even all the other big Big 12 schools and even all the other big DNs in the, in the nation, you know. My mindset was there's someone just as talented me out, out there as me mm-hmm. or maybe even a little bit more talented. Or there's probably even someone less talented that's working harder than me. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, well, if I take the skills and you know the attributes and you know the God-given abilities that God blessed me with, and then just roll from there, um, you know, I don't know the I don't know the verse exactly off my head, but it's Colossians three twenty three. Yeah, you know that's one of my favorite verses because you know that's just you know you need to go out there and work hard whatever you do whatever, yeah. whatever you're doing you just need to do it 100 full speed master yep. your craft yeah do all your work essentially the lord not yep. the man yeah mm-hmm. so it's awesome um who is your like growing up and even now in the college who is like your nfl sort of icon or yeah. idol the guy that you <laughs> want to be like a defensive end man yeah um well it's kind of it's kind of funny you ask that it's obviously a uh, clay matthews is my idol growing up yeah yeah um, and he was my idol because I always compared my physical stature to someone that I wanted to be like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to compare myself to, you know, people compare me to JJ Watt, but you know, JJ Watts two or three inches taller than me and weighs 40 more pounds than me. Yeah. So like, that's not me physically. So I compare myself to Clay Matthews, same height, same weight, you know, same kind of body stature a little bit. Um, you know, same speed, kind of same style of play as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I idolized myself after him because he was obviously very successful. He's going to be a Hall of Famer in the future. Yeah. He's a Super Bowl champion, all pro. And, uh, you know, the thing that I liked about him, he didn't even start. He played at, he played at Southern California. He's from California originally. He was a walk-on at USC. Mm -hmm. Um, He was kind of like me, kind of the same story. You know, we got there. Um, you know, I wasn't small, but you know, I wasn't where I wanted to be. Yeah. He was, he was pretty small. He was like six, three, like one ninety when he got to USC playing linebacker and he just worked hard by his senior. He didn't, he didn't even start at USC until his senior year. Yeah. And he got drafted and, you know, he got drafted, you know, just from one year of good film. Yeah. And he was a special teams player and uh, he was just a good example to look up to because he was just a guy that was hard nosed and played with a lot of grit. Yeah. 
And that obviously, you know, his success came a little bit later in the NFL. You know, he didn't, he had success in college, obviously, but, you know, he wasn't some, you know, amazing, you know, all Pac-12 linebacker. You know, he got drafted and made his mark in the NFL. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, too, that, you know, Clay Matthews was my, was my idol. And I remember, you know, even doing this with you a few times, you know, before you go to sleep and before a game, you know, just close your eyes and visualize yourself making plays. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I would I would do that. And then 10 minutes before we were out the tunnel, every pregame, I went to YouTube, I got my phone, I looked up Clay Matthews highlights. Yeah. Because he was doing things that I, that I know I could do as well. Mm -hmm. And it's simple because, you know, what you put in your mind, what you put in your head, is going to affect you, you know, whether it's negative stuff and you tell yourself you can't do something, you're probably not going to be able to do it. Versus if you do tell yourself you're going to, you can do it, you probably will. And that's why I loved watching those Clay Matthews highlights. Cause it was like, okay, he's doing this. He's making plays. He's doing these pass rush moves on these tackles. Um, and I knew I could do that because mm -hmm. I'm the same size, same height, same weight, um, same speed. Like if he can do it, why can't I? Yeah. So that's why I idled him so much because I like to compare myself to as close as possible, you know, to guys like me. Yeah. Because especially guys who are more successful than me, who've had a lot more success like Clay Matthews. Um, Cause I just look up to him like, okay, if he can do it, I know I can do it as well. Maybe not right now, but once I put in the work and all the, you know, all the craft, then I can do it in my near future. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. And it's something also that we teach our mindset athletes, you know, we have them find like, hey, who is someone with a very similar build to you? Who's someone with a very similar style to you? Mm -hmm. Like you said, who's successful at a very high level? Yeah. And then watch film on that person, hang a picture of them in, in your bedroom or, you know, as your screensaver on your phone or whatever, mm -hmm. and then realize like if they can do it, you can do it too. Exactly. And, and I'm big on highlight film. Um, people watch film and sports for different reasons. One of my main reasons for film is not so much like to critique yourself because as human beings, I think a lot of times this is probably this way for everybody. I'm certain it is. If 100 people told you something and 99 of those comments were positive, but one was negative, which one do you tend to focus on? Yeah, the, negative. the negative, right? Yeah. So as athletes, we're often our hardest critics. And so a lot of times we can focus on the negative. And so it's really great to, make your own highlight reel, go watch yourself mm -hmm. and see the good things that you do. Because if we're breaking down film, a lot of times we're looking at the negative we do and like, oh man, okay, I got to correct that right there. But on the days that you're not feeling it, on the days that maybe you had a bad game, whatever, and your mind's focused on the negative, let's go look at the positive a little bit. And then you'd be like, you know what? Dang, I am pretty good, man. That was a nice play right yeah. there, you know? And so yeah. you're, you're feeding your, your own positive, you're feeding your brain and then seeing other high level people do it and wanting to model after them so yeah, yeah that's excellent yeah. and of course you know the hair man so yeah. the, the clay matthews hair yeah right? exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> so which is awesome yeah. okay uh faith you know uh, a big part of my life is faith and coach p's perspective you know coaching inspiration and faith mm -hmm. uh, faith is a part of your life and whenever you were a senior in high school you know you were in my bible study and so what kind of role has faith played in your life as a college athlete and just a human being yeah, well, college, you know, you go through a lot of tough times. Yeah. Um, especially being a college athlete. Yeah. You, know? um, you wake up and do the same thing every day over and over and over. And there's some days you wake up and you're just like, holy crap, I do not feel like doing this today. Yeah. Um, but like I said, Colossians 323, you know, that's my favorite verse. Um, God, you know, God gave me all these, you know, natural abilities, you know, size, speed, strength, height, weight. He gave me these. I didn't ask for them. Yeah. And I'm blessed that he gave me these. So it's my honor to him to go out and do as much as I can with the abilities that he mm. gave me. That's how I look at it. Yeah. So on those days, you know, I didn't feel like it. I was like, you know what, I'm here to, I'm here to do this, you know, and, and even, you know, going back to leadership, you know, setting the example what if a leader just walks into a workout and you can just tell they don't have the charisma that you can tell that they don't want to be there. You know, it happens to everyone, you know, even the best athletes in the world, you know, there's days that they wake up and they don't feel like doing it, but they yeah. still wake up and do it anyways, you know, hundred percent full speed. And um, that's just how I approach my mindset every day, every lift, every run, every practice. And, um, you know, obviously I go to bed every night, you know, I just, 
I, pr I probably say the same prayer every night before mm -hmm. I go to bed. I just say, God, thank you so much for everything that you have blessed me with. Um, I cannot describe how thankful and blessed I am to be in the position, be in the shoes I am today. Yeah. Because there's so many people out there that, you know, would love to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And if I'm waking up complaining about saying, damn, I don't want to do this today, you know, there's someone out there that would love to do that. Yeah. And that just makes it, I just, I just take things and put it in a certain perspective that, you know, make it a lot more positive. So, um, but yeah, like I said, going back, you know, I wake up every day and, uh, you know, every night when I go to sleep, I just say, I just give God my grace and my thanks for thankfulness and just thank him for everything that he's blessed me with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Thanksgiving gratitude, those are huge parts of life right there. And um, it's easy to take a lot of things for granted you know, and so whenever you are giving back that thanks and not taking them for granted and realizing, and here's the thing, man, you're this big set athlete, but every day is not rainbows and sunshine. I mean, there are days, there are times you had to deal with the injury during your, yeah. you know, during your college career, mm -hmm. there are all these ups and downs. And so I think a lot of times when you go through those and you can look back and really be grateful for all the good times and all the good things that have happened. Mm -hmm. um, if you could go back and kind of look over your college career, and pick out a couple of things that you would say, you know what, man, if I was going to give advice to myself as a freshman yeah. or an incoming freshman, like here's two or three things that you should do to reach your highest potential. What would those things be? Yeah. Um, that's kind of a hard question because I'm trying to think, you know, looking back as if I was a freshman, um, you know, if I were, if I was looking back and a freshman came in, um, you know, I already said it, but, you know, work harder than anyone else and, you know, put in more work if you want to be successful. Um, if you just want to be average, you know, some guys, you know, they just show up, get the work done, they leave, you know, which is fine. I mean, that's their prerogative. That's what they want to do. But um, but guys who actually really want to be the best they can, you know, I tell them those things, you know, yeah. work harder and put in more work than everyone else. Uh, but looking back as a freshman, you know, you know, coming into college, you know, you're a complete different person when you get to college and when you leave college yeah. just because of, you know, that's probably, that's probably the most important time of your development of, of the transition from becoming a, becoming a kid to a young adult. Yeah. And it's just crazy. You know, if I, if I, if I was a, you know, if I was a freshman and um, you know, I was who I am today, I'll look back and I've probably given the advice of, um, you know, just go out there and work hard. I don't even know what to say, honestly, it just, um, just keep your keep your mind straight. Keep your mind on the end goal, which is obviously to get a, get a degree and to be the best football player you can be. Yeah. And um, you know, another thing I would say is, you know, you're gonna have a lot of teammates. You know, on a football team, you have 100 plus teammates. Um, a lot of those guys are comp gonna complain, gonna moan about stuff. You know, not want to be there. They're gonna talk. Oh, I'm getting screwed. Blah 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 blah. Whatever it is. Um, you can't control them. You know, you can just control yourself, your own attitude, your own mindset. So that's part of the advice I'm giving. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Like you said, working hard. And then that's a good one. Control the controllables again. Right. So yeah. control you and can't control everybody else around you. You can just contribute, you know, what you can, but mm -hmm. okay. Last question. I always give everybody this. And so you get to, you get to pick. Okay. Okay. I call it fast feet because as athletes, we got have fast feet. So I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, but you can tell me about, one or you can pick all three all right so i want you to tell me about a highlight a hero or a hardship in your life and then just expound upon it and why you chose that one highlight hero okay. or a hardship or it can be a little beach okay like a football highlight or like just anything any in any life yeah in general yep um highlight hero or hardship highlight hero or hardship um you know highlight was there wasn't a certain time i got my highlight but it was it was when i gained that confidence um, in football and I knew because even my freshman sophomore year of college you know the NFL was never really a dream of mine it was never really something I ever thought of yeah I was just kind of like I'm just gonna go out there and do my best on what I can do and you know I started making plays and I was like okay maybe maybe I am as good as people say I am because every time someone say oh you're you're good at this you're good at that I'd be like no nah, like I still got a lot to work on and you know people telling you how good you are all the time you know I don't, I don't listen to that because, you know, there's the same person telling you how bad you are. Yeah. And not saying you have to listen to people, the outside sources, but you have to be realistic with yourself and you have to tell yourself, you know, what you're good at and what you're bad at. Mm. 
Um, so like the highlight is, you know, kind of where I gained my confidence, you know, after my red shirt freshman year, after I got, you know, freshman all American, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can be a good football player in college. So that off season, you know, I went to work, I worked super hard. Uh, you know, I took that off season super seriously and put on like 15, 20 pounds. And, uh, you know, once I got my confidence, I was like, okay, I'm taking off from here. I'm just going to go out there and go balls to walls the rest of my career. And, um, you know, it got me to where I am today. I'm thankful for it. Um, my hero, I'd like to say probably, obviously my parents, just because, yeah. um, you know, they both can, they both have so many good characteristics in themselves. Um, you know, my dad is like super smart, super business minded, um, will always give me good advice. Um, and my mom's like super nice, super sweet person, a super caring person. Yeah. Will always do, you know, best with what's for the person next to her rather than for herself. Um, you know, they're both the people who developed me into who I am today, made me a good person. And, uh, you know, I still look up to them to this day and what yeah. they do for me and, you know, how they treat people and what they do for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then hero highlight and hardship. hardship yeah. Um, hardship well you know i'm pretty thankful you know i haven't gone through a lot of super hard times um but you know obviously you know people pass away in your family people get old now both my grandparents have passed away i was super close to both of them yeah um that was tough uh, just because i was super close to them they both loved to watch me and my siblings play sports and grow up and um i haven't really had a whole super defining moment um i mean i guess you know, kind of like going back to what we talked about. I remember it was my junior year of high school and then we were in the season and going back to kind of what we talked about of the happy medium between your social life and, you know, how much work and effort and energy you put into your sport. I was putting so much effort and energy into my sport with football my junior year of high school. that I finally got to a point like midway season. I was like, I do not want to play football anymore. I was like, I don't want to touch a football see a football I don't want to play I'm done with football yeah and I was being completely serious about it too I was like so I talked to my parents and like these obviously sat me down it's like hey well, like why are you thinking this blah blah they want to know what I was thinking while I was thinking that but I was just honestly putting too much pressure and too much stress on myself about being good yeah about being good at what I do and that was honestly a hardship it didn't last for very long probably lasted for a week or two but mm -hmm. I was like holy crap like I do not want to do this anymore. Yeah. But, you know, I kind of snapped myself back into reality a little bit, you know, um, and uh, I just, you know, obviously kind of got that resolved within my own mind and, you know, just obviously continue to work on that balance between, you know, social life and football and, you know, mm -hmm. having that free time to yourself where you can have that peaceful state of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that, man, because it's a real hardship. I and mean, that's something that I think everybody, whether it be, your sport or your job, you know, whenever you really care about something, there's, there's a point where you may feel a little burned out. You may feel a little tired and you yeah. want to give up. You want to stop doing it. Um, but you seek advice, right? So you talk to your parents, you mm -hmm. get other perspectives and then you sit on it and you wait and you think it through. You don't just make these rash decisions, yeah. you know, and then typically that feeling because feelings are fickle, that feeling goes away and yeah. then you start to regain your passion. And that's another thing too, is like, always remembering why you, why you started, why you love what you're doing, you know, and um, for me, you know, talking to you and watching you play football, you know, I see your passion for the sport. I see your love for the sport. And anytime somebody really goes in and tries to perfect their craft, mm -hmm. I think for anyone, man, like that's an inspirational thing yeah. to watch someone try to perfect their craft and put their everything into it. Cause what it does for the rest of us, it inspires us. Like, man, I want to be great at what I do too. Yeah. You know? So for me as coach and friends, getting to watch you do this has been inspirational for me as well. And then now to see you, you know, get ready to jump levels. I mean, dude, you've already accomplished a bunch, right. Yeah. And, but now getting ready to jump levels and, and chase the next thing is awesome. Uh, being a lion chaser, right. Like not being afraid to go after it, exactly. you know, and we talked the other day, and the goal isn't just to make it to the NFL. The goal is to thrive in the NFL, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and the same things that got you here are going to get you there. 
because you're going to continue to learn and have new coaches you're going to add and, yep. and you know you got the work ethic and all those things so now it's just yep. continuing the process but yep. all right man any any closing words as we get ready to be done um for family friends k-staters anybody yeah uh well i don't know coach just appreciate you for having me and uh, yeah you know hope what we talked about today can encourage you guys um for you and your kids or whoever else just uh um, just go out there and just be the best version of themselves as possible. Cause you know, in reality, you know, pretty much everything we talked about today is just, you know, working on ourselves and being, being a better person than we were the day before. And that's pretty much the main sum of everything. So excellent. All right, man. So it's been Wyatt Hubert, you know, who, uh, was a starter for K-State last three years, um, all big 12, you know, going to be an all American and getting ready to go, you know, make his, make his jump to the NFL. Oh, yeah. So I'm honored to have you here. I'm yeah. excited. Um, you know, I'm grateful I got to coach you whenever you were younger and then maintain our relationship. So for everybody listening, it's been another episode of Coach P's Perspective. May God bless you, smile upon you, and give you peace. Till next time, we're out.